and welcome back to the Dreamcast. I am your host, Denise Walsh. I combine science, scripture, and stories that will inspire you to dive deep, break through your own personal glass ceiling, and design a life of your dreams. I believe that we can thrive in all areas of life at the same time. But where do we begin? Personally, financially, spiritually, relationally... And often because we don't know where to focus, we do nothing. At least that's the space I lived in for several years. I know what it feels like to constantly be spinning my wheels. And that's exactly why I created the Dream Life Daily Journal. After working through the Dream Life Action Planner, we need to do something every day so we actually take steps in the direction we desire. Throughout the years, I've developed success habits that have helped me to create a Dream 10 life in all areas by focusing on one area at a time. And I teach you exactly what to do each and every day in the Dream Life Daily Journal. You'll find a gratitude game every day to start the morning off right. A space for prayer, meditation, journaling. A space to write down your clear and intentional dream life goal with affirmations and visualizations connected to that goal. You'll then have a spot to write down your dream life action to-do list so you can be intentionally taking action towards your goal every single day. I know that by completing the Dream Life Daily Journal every day for at least 30 days, you can create momentum. And when you do that, my friends, you can live your dream life too. Check out the dreamlifetoolkit.com or Amazon to get your copy of the Dream Life Daily Journal today. Big, big welcome back to the Dreamcast. You guys, I love hanging out with people who dig deep and create their dream lives because they leave so many clues. They are able to help us do the exact same thing by teaching us what they have done and experienced. And our next guest is laser focused on helping Christian business owners hone in on what is most important to their business and personal lives and confidently know and achieve their Holy Spirit inspired vision. I I think we like that Holy Spirit inspired vision. You know that spark that kind of lights your soul on fire when you are in the zone and you go this is what I'm supposed to do. You know, that Holy Spirit inspired vision, your whole, every cell of your body gets excited about that. And and with two decades as a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist and successful dual entrepreneur, she is able to ask us the powerful questions that will help us turn our vision into reality. So big Dreamcast, welcome to the CEO of Christian Biz Owners on Fire, Christina Weber. Thanks, Denise. I'm glad to be here. I am so excited we got connected because we really are like soul sisters. When when I got the chance to be interviewed on your show, we just resonate. We, we, we yeah. speak the same language and I'm okay. connecting with you later this week on our own vision call and you're asking me the tough questions. So I'm excited for that too. You're up for it, Denise. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm totally game. And I wanted to introduce you to to my audience because I feel like You have a lot of experience and wisdom that can help us as well. So before we dive into what you're doing now, I'd love to hear you were a therapist, just like I was. How did you get into that field? Well, actually, I started out in marketing and business, and I worked in corporate sales, but I grew up with a psychologist father, so I really had no intention of going into that. But actually, what started it was, you know, when I got a job with Xerox, which at the time was a very progressive company. So it was a really positive experience, even though it was a corporate environment. But I really, you know, I'm one of those people that looks way ahead, not just in this, but I also look eternally. But I was concerned with what I saw ahead. I saw a lot of people divorced. I saw a lot of work imbalance. I thought at one point I'd want to work part-time with kids. I couldn't see that working with that. Even job sharing or something. I just don't want someone else to raise my kids. It wasn't meaningful to me to sell copiers and (laughs) digital solutions. You know, I realized I have a pretty strong desire to have meaning what I do. So 
within a couple of years, I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do. So actually, my dad do an interest test on me. And that's when I decided to go back to grad school and then went into the marriage and family. And to be honest, a lot of it was about my own personal interests and also about wanting to work part time, wanting to have control of my hours. It's very self-serving. Of my, it wasn't like I wanted to save the world or help everybody. <laughs> it was more that I wanted, I knew that would be an easier way to use my gifts and then come home, then transition from the hardcore work world to being a mom. It just was, it was more feminine energy being a therapist. And I liked, it was uh, not a jolt, you know, trying to go into worlds like that. Wow. That's really interesting because instead of just saying, what do I want to do now? You really had that long-term view of what do I want my life to look like in five years, 10 years? When I have a family, what career will allow me to live in my gifts and skills, but also be a present mom and home at, yeah. you know, hours and, and things like that. And so you, you kind of started with the end in mind, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And most people don't. That's that's kind of <laughs> a little bit of my secret sauce because I almost do it to an extreme. But um, yeah, most people, because I, I also think it eternally too. So, and most people don't, even very advanced spiritual people don't. Okay. Um, they just don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so how long were you in the marriage and family therapist world? Actually practiced for about 20 years with my dad. And then I transitioned. It was really an eight-year transition to coaching. I always was kind of a coach-like therapist. I wasn't a sit on the couch, let's talk about your past type of therapist. I was more solution-focused. But you know, really, the clincher was in 2008, the margins for therapy. When therapy is a field where you're very educated, but your expenses go up and your, your reimbursement goes down. <laughs> There's no, there's no reward for doing better or, you know, the more you learn, you know, if you're going to be practicing in a traditional model. So basically in 2008, a lot of the insurance companies lowered the margins. A lot of therapists went out of business and my dad was looking at retirement. I knew I had a nicer office that I could afford on my own. So I knew I was going to need to bring people in or do something. And the other thing about it, you know, there's a lot of restrictions working in an agency on faith. I was always a faith-based therapist which I thought was ridiculous that you can't even ask about spirituality in other settings. It just doesn't make any sense. So, but really in an agency, there were guidelines that that was, and I saw it coming with the Obamacare kind of moving to a single payer thing, not only economically, but in terms of putting more restrictions on what you could do as a therapist. And I had always been in a private practice setting, so I never had to deal with that. And I was always ethical about it. I mean, I made it clear what I was and, and did that ethically because you're in a power position and you need to be responsible with that with your clients. But anyway, so those were some of the factors of why I made that transition to coaching. I, like I said, it was about an eight year transition, but 20, 20 plus years practicing. Awesome. Well, and a couple of things I hear you saying is that you, again, saw three to five years out. You were experiencing transition with the decline in 2008 recession. Right. Uh, things were shifting, but you were also... You weren't re just reacting to what was happening now. You were thinking ahead. You were thinking forward. You were, trying, you were assessing where things were going and where you wanted to be as things progressed. So what were some of the hurdles you came up against going from an agency or a private practice where people are coming to you and it's more of a traditional model to really, you're still using your gifts and skills, but it looks a little different now. Yeah, it was tough because it was a time issue. I mean, I, I needed to do the therapy to, to pay the bills, but I wasn't getting out there enough to develop the, the coaching thing and market that. And there's, there's a lot of moving parts in developing a coaching and consulting business, in any business, really. It's not even the business. You have the business and then marketing the business. Your business is marketing your business. <laughs> and so even though I had a marketing background, I really struggled with getting all of those things, work, getting the model right, you know, knowing exactly what I was, was solving, the problem I was solving getting my niche right. I was moving in the right direction, but like I started with a too narrow knee. I mean, I made a lot of niche mistakes and that's huge. It's very expensive. And that's one of the reasons why I say I'm a coach and consultant, not just a coach, because a coach really lets people kind of come to these certain conclusions. A consultant will say, Denise, 
I really wouldn't recommend you do that because of boom, boom, boom. And I really wish I would have been uh, mentored in that way because it was very expensive. The decisions I made that were incorrect were quite expensive. And I really wish someone would have been a little more directive with me. So that's the way I am with my clients. And now, actually, frankly, all of the mistakes that I've made make me a much better consultant and coach because I've almost done them all. I mean, it it's one thing if you just fall into your business and it really flows. You cannot relate to the majority of people that really struggle with a lot of these different things. People really are best at what they were worst at. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't make money if you, I mean, I did not just paying people money. I couldn't make money. I couldn't manage my time. I mean, I just, everything you need to do to have a business, I struggle with. I'm very kind of out there, visionary, not detail oriented. That was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's funny how it works out, but because you have to try harder, you actually learn the nuts and bolts of, okay, this is how you manage your time. Cause it didn't come naturally. Yeah. You know, I had to learn it. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I think the the things that we struggle with the most, we then can offer the most hope to people who are struggling with it too, because right. we had to figure it out. And then once we figure it out, we're like, oh gosh, this hurts. <laughs> Yeah. Tell everyone. <laughs> right, right. I did the same thing with weight. I used to struggle with my weight and I learned over the years of how to handle that. And now, you know, I'm in, I'm 53 and a lot of people my age really, you know, menopause is hitting or don't, you know, or even sooner. And I've really learned how to do that very naturally and effortlessly. And it's because it was a struggle earlier and I just decided I wanted to learn how to fix, you know, how to do that, have that in order, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a few of the time management strategies you learned, because a lot of us are still either working a full-time job or we're a stay-at-home mom with a side gig, a hustle that we're working to build in our spare time, part-time which can feel like we don't have enough hours in the day to get everything done. What are some things you did when you were in that transition? I wouldn't say I'm in it. I still struggle. I'll tell you, it's all about vision. You got to know where you're going because that's what keeps you persistent through the, the daily failures that you're going to have trying to juggle it all. And the other thing too is when a lot of times people, if they're not clear about their vision, they're really trying to get somebody else's vision. And God has given you a vision, a Holy Spirit inspired vision that you can absolutely accomplish with him. It's going to be outside of your reach, but with him, you can't accomplish it. But when it's not clearly your vision or your baggage of your mom's vision or husband's vision, or, you know, that's when you start fragmenting because you're torn between, you know, what you really want inside and what you think you want, what so-and-so is doing and comparing and all of that. So that's number one is be clear in your vision and then I, I have changed. I had a earlier, my little tagline was I help people do more, make more money in less time. I've totally changed that. Now, my definition of time mastery is time mastery is not make, doing more in less time. It's being clear about your priorities and doing those. So I have learned now true time management. I actually work less. I spend more of my day in prayer and grounding. I spend the first two hours probably of my day. Now, I, I'm efficient with it. I mean, I, I get up, I, I have my prayers on audio, have scripture on audio, I have another thing, probably literally about to go to mass. I'm folding laundry, I'm doing this stuff. So I've got systems, but I literally come into the office later because I have found just doing all that grounding stuff. And at the same time, I'm getting ready, I'm putting my, you know, everything's getting ordered in my home that I get more clarity of what to do. I'm better with clients. What I give clients is my presence and my connection to God. That's what I give them. So if I'm fragmented coming in, I'm not that conduit I need to be. It's not me doing stuff. It's, it's me being willing to put myself in that space so I can be, I really hold space for clients. I mean, that's what I do. And the better I can do that, the better results I get. And I will tell you, my clients get really good results and they don't even meet with me that much because I really listen. I'm really present when I'm there. I've been through a lot of the hard knocks myself, so I kind of know some of the <laughs> mistakes. And I, I've been really pleased as I've transitioned into this, getting testimonials and things, of just the feedback I'm getting from clients. And I see it too. I see their transformation. I think a lot of coaches and things that give you tons of stuff to do, that's really not what I've found to work. What I found to work is me being centered, me being clear, attracting the clients that really want what gifts I really can offer. 
and then being grounded and let the Holy Spirit do it. I mean, I'm very intuitive. So I'm at skills, obviously. I'm very intuitive, but I know where we want to go with that client. I know what I ask my clients at first to say, where do you want to be in two months and in nine months? So you'll be delighted. And I get that up front and I'll negotiate. Like I'll have some say, I want to make a hundred thousand dollars and it's nine, you know, and they're making nothing. And I'll, and I'll say, you know what? You totally can. But if you want to be balanced, if you want to work out, if you want to be able to go to your Bible studies at night, that might be a, something you phase in over a longer time. So I'm able to negotiate the expectations up front. And then I really find very little resistance with clients because with me, everything's on the table, their relationships, God, their business. A lot of business coaches are not comfortable talking about those things and they totally affect your, your goals and everything. I mean, they're part of your vision. So there's nothing like hidden that someone hasn't shared. I mean, people talk about their sex life with me. <laughs> <laughs> I was being a therapist. I mean, there's people feel very comfortable just laying. Plus, I'll ask, you know, if I think there's something that's a problem, I'll go, what about this? You know, how are things going with your husband right now? Or, you know, I mean, I'll, other people won't do that, you know, and I can sense that it's a problem, you know, or something's happening. So that's, that's my secret sauce to time management is just realizing it's narrowing down. It's doing less not doing more and being more clear and not trying to work with people that don't really need what you do, you know, really make sure you're aligned. If you're aligned, it's a real win-win. Yeah. Yeah. And what I hear you saying is knowing your priorities and then putting them in your calendar and then being present in that priority moment. Like when you're doing your laundry and you're listening to personal development and your scriptures and getting ready, you're there and you're allowing those things to really impact you at a cellular level. You know, you're like, yeah. you're like allowing those things to go deep within you and connection and build that connection. So then when it's work time and you've got a client, you're fully there and you can create space for someone to feel safe for someone to answer the hard questions that you're going to ask, but then have really great, meaningful conversations about what it is they want and how they can move forward with less busy work and more productivity yeah. because they're super clear too. Yeah. And I'd say there's one other component to it, and that is being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. There's a balance between being vulnerable and seeming incompetent, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> And so I feel like I naturally do that well. Like you're constantly struggling with new things in business. I mean, it's new level, new devil. I mean, if you're growing, you're always going to be, or even in your life or things that don't work out or things you didn't do well or whatever. I think even when I get my notes out late to my clients, you know, I, I apologize. I have my own time management problems. You know, I try to make it right. I apologize. But I'm modeling for them imperfection. You know, to grow imperfectly is really... People kill their businesses by trying to be perfect and they, they feel like they have to have it all together or whatever. And it's actually that genuine authenticity that really makes people feel like they can thrive because they're not afraid to make mistakes because you're making mistakes and they don't perceive you as a loser, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> you know, that you're still making it and, you know, absolutely. You you're giving them permission. Yeah. permission to take action imperfectly and to learn as they go, because that's really what we all do, right? Yeah. Well, actually, people don't do that. They get stopped before they even do the action because they're trying to do everything perfect or they don't have, they don't feel like it's okay to look bad or to put yourself out there. But it's by doing the action, a lot of times when making the mistakes, that helps you grow. And I would say most people don't take the action. Ooh, you guys, if you're hearing this and you are thinking, Hmm. I would rather be perfect than take that action and use us as calling you out right now. <laughs> because we're both saying that you learn as you go, right? Yeah. I am a action first, think later often. And so I want to add more of the vision into yeah. my business and making sure I'm going exactly where I need to go because I can, I'll take action and pivot and learn and grow. But it sounds like you, it's really great skill to have both. Well, and I think Denise, to put a plug in for what you're doing, you built a great business though, because you just, you didn't overthink it. Yeah. I did. And there's an advantage to that. So now you put yourself in a position where you can kind of step back, you've got some breathing room and now you can maybe develop that other part of you that isn't as developed, but that I would not discount the way you do it because I, and everybody's your temper. Like I can't do stuff unless it's perfectly <laughs> 
I mean, I, I don't want to say perfectly. It has to be aligned with my purpose. I don't have to do the act perfect. It's actually unconscious. I don't do stuff and I don't know why, but it's an unconscious barrier. If it's not aligned with my purpose and when it's aligned, man, it just, everything flows. So where someone like you, you're able to do stuff and then you want to, it's just a different way. It's not a less way. It's yeah. a different way, but ultimately I need to be more like that. And probably you need to, you know, have those gifts yeah. because then the action's more targeted towards really the bigger purpose. And that's really a transition I made in my business now is probably because of my own dependency on God. That's deeper now than it used to be is I realized, you know, I'm just here. Use me, you know, I use me, God. I mean, really, and I did not used to think this way. I mean, I'm like, I want to help other people understand their purpose because I see so many talented people. We don't want to waste that. And this gets back to that eternal perspective. I mean, the bottom line is if you're a Christian, you understand we're in the middle of the spiritual warfare. And, and this matters. You know, what your impact is on souls matters. And if you're maybe off track, you're doing something else that's not totally what God really had planned for you that could have a huge impact on souls. And not that you have to be talking about it, but just whatever you're doing, that there are real costs to that eternally, serious costs. And so anyway, so that's kind of my, my, my different, I guess, later in the game understanding of what, what the purpose is about. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I think that we always learn and grow and, and pivot. So you become really good at having that long-term vision, but then creating the time management strategies for every day so you can stay grounded, balanced, and give to your clients a hundred percent. So you say that you ask people the hard questions because not everybody does. Not everybody talks about all areas of life when in fact, all areas of life are impacting business and they all do bleed into each other. So what are some of the hard questions you typically ask your clients? Well, I sense blocks, you know, like I sense when something's not, I'm very intuitive. So I, I also read between the lines and I'll hear certain things and I'll be, I'm curious. Like, I don't assume I know where they're going, but I'll ask them things. Well, for example, a lot of common thing with women is that if they've been married and, they're, and they've not been in a real successful business, this is a transition or whatever, that's going to change the dynamics of their relationship. And I, everybody, almost everybody within a couple of months in will bring up something about relationships. That like there's a fear of, well, if I really shine, is that going to strain my relationship? How's my husband going to take that? If I do really successful over here, am I going to have time for him? Is he going to be threatened? I know my own thing. I had fears of if I had hit a certain level of abundance, would I not attract a certain kind of man that I would want to attract? Like they would be intimidated by that? Or would I attract someone that's kind of like a gold digger type that really wasn't really, there was another motive there? So I just first look for blocks. I look for First of all, are they using their talents the right way? If you're trying to use your things that aren't really your talent, I mean, we use your strength. I mean, you don't get somebody else to do the weaknesses part. <laughs> you know, you grow from doing your strengths. Um, so if they're using their strengths, they've got a good business model, they're doing that, but they're running into a block, that's when I start to get curious. And I start to just see, you know, what I think's happening. And then I'll just ask. And usually I'm dead on, you know, and usually it's not something they would volunteer. Um, for example, the vision session I, I we're going to do, half of the time people cry in that. I mean, men, men, women, everybody. And I don't like <laughs> needle someone. It's just I'm asking, like, I'm just, I don't take the first thing. I say, well, what is that, you know? And I, and I can be present with people. And that's the therapy skills that you and I have. You know, I don't have to talk, 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 talk. You know, I can stop and be present. Whereas they think someone without those skills talks over the opportunity for the person to have a breakthrough because it's touching them and you can tell it's touching them. And if you can just be present for them, they'll get a huge epiphany. Well, I'll give you an example. I had a client, it's a couple and they, she has a lot of fear of economic insecurity. And so they need to make some changes in their business to grow. They need to get a, a, a warehouse. She's afraid of the outlay. And what if we don't have the business and I don't want to get, you know, debt and all this. And I looked at her and it was funny because we were doing the calls on the phone and we just, I just switched into zoom and I looked at her I could, and I was really at a handicap when I couldn't see her. And when, and when I looked at her, I, she just had this thing of just, she kept putting roadblocks and then taking the steps they need to do. And I said, so where does that come from? You know, where, and she started crying 
and she was just like, you know, just this fear of just everything being chaotic and, you know, not working out. And it just, it just, it was not about their business. It was about her own maybe issues around abundance or feeling unsupported. So what you can do is if you have those skills, which you do, I mean, you can go into that, you help them work through that, the business takes care of itself because that was the block. Well, and what I hear you saying too, is you are asking the questions that we gloss over. You're asking the question, you're talking about the fear. You're getting to the heart of the matter. <laughs> yeah. And, and instead of taking the surface to answer, you're allowing them to really get connected themselves and be honest with themselves. And that is transformational in all areas of yeah. life. So I love that you're able to read between the lines, to ask questions and then hear what they need that maybe is a little bit deeper than what they're actually saying and give them the space to go right. there. Yeah. I think a lot of people in my field don't go deep enough. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And so you've got a lot of different services that you offer. Can you tell me a little bit about the programs that you have? Yeah, I have uh, two different levels of clients in my business end. Um, I have the entrepreneur that could be admitted a longer time or new that is juggling. All of them are faith based, usually juggling. Okay, all the different things you got to do in your business. You got to bring money in. You got to be doing all these things, and they want it's important to them to stay true to their family, or they don't want to blow that off for their self care. So that I just basically help them figure out the blueprint to make money and do it in a balanced way. So that's kind of my, and we just reverse engineer and, and that type of client. Then I have other clients that are more high end, like they already have business skills. They've got the revenue. They've got a beautiful marriage, but it's like they're growing spiritually. And it's like, they know God's calling them to do more. And a lot of times it's men. Like they're trapped, they feel trapped. They've got the mortgage, the health insurance. They feel like they can't really take that jump to really use their talents fully. And so that's where the Christian manifesting uh, program comes in. And that's where I help. They're manifesting big things like leaving a safe, secure job as an engineer and being a sacred artist, having a that you can actually support your family with, or really doing something more meaningful and using their talents more. So I have those kind of clients. And then I have a whole other spinoff. Uh, and this kind of came out of things in my personal life. And what I was seeing with my clients is as you get more successful, um, and there's a scripture, I think it's Matthew 10, 6. It's the one about be as suave as ser serpents and as smooth as dove or whatever. I'm getting it off. But basically God's saying, you know, the worldly people actually do this better. <laughs> they're, they're more sharp. But we really are not that way as Christians. We go into things and we don't understand the, the, na the landscape. And there's a lot of people in more successful circles that struggle with narcissistic personality disorder or narcissism. And I kept seeing it over and over and over without advertising. 75% of my therapy clients were struggling with people in a relationship with this. 60% of my coaching clients were further along with the same. So I actually created a whole program for that. It's a group niche program. It's my same program. But when you've been affected by someone with narcissism, whether it's a spouse, a parent, coworker, whatever, what it does, especially the more intimate of the relationship, it does like a major number on your ability to manifest your dream. So we're not focused on that, but I just have a touch with that. And we've created a really great group model for that. Those are really the different aspects, but they're actually kind of this, it's really under the same thing. It's more, there's a certain touch. I needed a group program for that because they need to see each other. I was seeing all these people. I was like, oh my gosh, this is all the same things they're dealing with. They were not connecting it to the narcissistic, situation. And when I saw, when they put them together and they're like, oh my gosh, this isn't me. This is what I have responded to. And it was just so powerful. I mean, we did a pilot of that group a couple of years ago. The results that people got in that group blew me away. I mean, I just was like, I had a theory of what would work. I do it with my colleague who's a therapist, but the results they got were amazing. Kind of, it kind of get back to the intuitively kind of knowing what needed to happen and take, being willing to take a chance and try it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, this totally works, you know, um, for this group. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you'd have the one-on-one, -on -one, the business coaching where you're helping people to get that vision, figure out their time management. What do they need to do? How can they scale all the business type questions? But then also... Uh, it's powerful to have the group where there's camaraderie, there's community, and they're hearing other people's stories. So 
For people that don't know, can you describe what narcissism is? Well, the actual clinical definition is uh, as a personality disorder, they're more serious. I mean, types of mental disorders, usually from trauma and childhood. The way I would describe narcissism is at some point, and my colleague does this better, he explains someone told that person they're not good enough. And that person decided to create this false persona of them. And so they have their real self here and then they have this false persona. So you think of a narcissist like super confident, blah, blah, blah. That's not really, it's the opposite of the case. Because they have this dynamic of this false self outside and this wounded child that's frightened inside, they only, they're like vampires. I hate to be derogatory, but they have to have narcissistic supply to feel alive. Like you and I, if we don't feel good or something happened, we can talk to a friend, we can journal, we can go exercise, we can do, read a book. We can do things, pray to make ourselves feel better. A narcissist only feels alive with whatever their narcissistic supply is. So it could be sex, it could be praise, it could be money, it could be power. So it's a constant need for that, like a vampire constantly needs new blood. I mean, so what happens is they evolve into they have to use other people because they can't build in themselves. So if you like in a work environment, you know, they could use people up. I can spot them now, (laughs) but they have a lack of abundance, a lack of trust that things are going to work out. They got to take it on their own and really at the expense of others is as they get more progressed in their thing. They're, it's like any addiction. It's like that level of narcissistic supply doesn't fix it now. Now they need more. Now they need more. And they're hard to spot because a lot of times they look like they have different addictions. Like they'll flip around, but really it's all under narcissistic supply and it can kind of change. It's hard, it's hard for people to recognize, but it's way, people are way suffering with this more than people realize. I think it's about one in five and it's destroying marriages, it's destroying families. If you're in that situation, it's like you don't even know what's going on and you're it's shame building because what's going on at home isn't really matching the way it's being presented in public. And But it's like alcoholism was 30 years ago, that it was destroying families that people didn't talk about. So that's really where narcissism is. And our culture actually promotes it. And I can watch people raising their kids. They're going to be narcissists. I can see what they're doing. It's this entitlement feeling. Narcissists have a lack of empathy towards others. They really, it's a deep insecurity. But the thing is, it works for them. As long as it works for them, they're going to keep up the behavior. It's hard to let it go because narcissists don't want to be vulnerable. That's like the worst thing for a narcissist. So they're not able to have normal relationships with other because it's a, you have to be able to be vulnerable to have a healthy, normal relationships, but they don't have that. It's all a power. And frankly, there's a lot of narcissism. And I'm Catholic and I'm a devout Catholic, but there's a lot of priests who are narcissists. There are a lot of people in power positions who are narcissists. And you have to be very careful because they cross boundaries of, of what a normal person would do to get what they want. So you're very vulnerable if you don't recognize what's going on, the things that they'll do to get what they want. And okay, so somebody has a narcissistic relationship, they come to you because of business, they're like, my business needs to grow, it's not working, something's happening, there's all these blocks. It sounds like they're probably living in a bit of chaos, they're confused a lot because they're living with someone who's deeply insecure, like you mentioned, a wounded child who has this this front that needs and wants power and prestige and praise, and it's probably the um, attention all on them. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's very cool that you've created a space for those who've gone through. It's it's basically living in trauma for a bit. Um, yeah. And then there needs to be some healing for them personally, so they can see success in all other areas. I've got a few more questions about this manifesting program that you have, because on your website, it says, master the powerful skill of manifesting for Christ. And then you say that manifesting has taken the secular coaching world by storm, but yet it is something that is taught in the Bible. So tell me a bit about what manifesting means to you and why you use this word with your clients. Yeah. Yeah. The word actually means bring into being. I thought it meant create. Um, And I forgot to mention, I actually have a Christian manifesting workshop. That's another thing I do with people. But what it does is it's about you've already have the idea like this office I am was manifested. This is a I mean, it was an idea at some point and then it became tangible. 
So the resurrection is a manifestation, the incarnation is a manifestation. There are lots of references in scripture to manifesting. And there's less of, there's references on vision. Without vision, man will perish. So God manifests. He like knew where he wanted to go and then it like bring it into being. First of all, we've talked a little bit about some Christians are very uncomfortable with that term. And that's why I explain it, you know, in the context of it is scriptural. And my programs I do, I go have them go through all the scriptures on it. And I don't have a problem with someone questioning that because they should. We need to be prudent about what resources we use, what information, because like I was telling you before the show, that's the whole salvation history is the Jews kept looking for all these other things and not God. But I, I just want to, the difference I distinguish between Christian manifesting and more secular manifesting, they're both based on neuralistic programming, the way the brain is created, um, about vision. Your brain wants to filter out what's not going to create your vision, bring it. It's, it deals with your emotions, the way we're created. So it's all very science-based. The really difference is between the vision. In secular, it's about what do I want? What is it about me? You know, and I do that too. I have to give my clients permission to say it's okay to, to be clear on what you want. But the other thing I do with people is the more you have a sacramental and prayer life, what you want is also what God wants. And, and really what God wants is like we, we shoot too low. God is like, no, you know, this is. So what I joined my business or started my business because I want balance in my life. Well, God's like, you know, Christina, I want you to use your talents on a higher level, not just for that. He wants that too. The people who work with me are like rock stars. I mean, like I don't even do that much. And they're like, it's just using whatever your talent is on an exponential level, on a global level. You know, it doesn't mean you need to be famous. It could be you mentor one person and that person, like even you raise your child right and that person does wonderful. It doesn't have to be like what the world says is spectacular. It's, it's in the economy of, of eternity. God's up here, you know, and he, when you tap into that Holy Spirit inspired vision, you combine what you want, but you're growing and you're constantly open to where God's wanting you to lead. And that, that's why my, it, it unfolds, it, you know, like, and it, and a lot of times it's the circumstances in your life or the things that come up or the, the obstacles you face that help you gain clarity about well, what really is God wanting, because he prepares you for the next step. Because if you're saying yes to God's vision, I'm telling you, you will, you will experience spiritual warfare. I mean, that's Satan doesn't mess with people that aren't saying yes, because there's no need to. It's like they're no threat. <laughs> but when you start to say yes, it's more complicated because it's not only your own fears and, and stuff going on, but there really is a whole invisible world that doesn't want you to say yes to God, that wants you to stay smaller, that doesn't want you to fully use your talents that wants to give you confusing messages about that. So that's why you man I think God lets us manifest in layers because we got to be ready for that next thing ourselves through God, you know, because it, it is your target, you know, not to be afraid. He says, do not be afraid all the time. There's nothing to be afraid of, but that's why it's a process. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, manifesting means bring into being, like you said. So an idea and that idea, that inkling, that desire, as you have a prayer life and you're connected yourself, you're trusting that that is from God and you're taking action on that. And, and you can learn the skills to take it from idea into reality. And once mm -hmm. you know those skills, you really can apply it to all areas of your life. And, oh, you, and it's really amazing. I kind of call it the fruit of what God has given me, you know, the fruit of me, I'm staying in my lane, I'm doing my thing, I'm writing, I'm journaling, I'm connected, I'm adding value. And people tell me all the time, oh my gosh, this changed my life. Yeah. And I'm like, I just, I didn't do anything besides do me, you yeah. know, but God can use that in so many amazing ways and bring that idea into fruition and allow it to ripple effect into everybody that we encounter and of course there's fear that comes up and there's yeah. all these things that that which is why we need support when we're, yeah. when we're acting on these big visions but i love that you've created the christian manifesting mastery program to teach us these skills because yeah. i don't think we all understand and i know i didn't until i understood it the how much uh, the holy spirit living within us like how powerful we truly are yeah well and, and denise you said it right it's really you being you because I really and even even non-Christians, I've worked with people that are non-Christians, too, um, that are spiritual. 
And what what they like this idea is everything about you is created specifically for your mission, for your unique Holy Spirit, how you look, where you live, who you're married to, where you know what your struggles are. Every single thing about you, he's going to make everything about you be perfectly suited for that. And so you really don't have to do something outside of yourself. It's really just about using your gifts fully and like what you teach people about working through those fears. Don't, that's really where the other side tries to get us down is just to, oh, who are you to think to do that? Or you shouldn't do that. Or, you know, or you can't have that. Or that's against Christian if you do that. And, you know, we need to discern, but it really is really as simple as just being you. God put you wherever you were, where you had that impact on people. And it's not as complicated as people think it is. It really isn't. And I know that when you're working with your clients, not only are you teaching them vision and you're helping them with every step of the way, but you also can teach people this manifesting skill. And you have put together a five manifesting mistakes that people do because they do overcomplicate it, don't they? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> you know, I think we don't know what we don't know until we know it, you know, and if this is a new concept for you, or you really haven't learned about it yet, it really, for me, it made so much sense once I truly understood what it was all about. So how do people get this five manifesting mistakes from you? Um, you can go right to the landing page on that. Christina M. Weber, and Weber spelled with one B and Christina C-H-R. Christina M. Weber, and you can jump right on and get that. It's uh, five manifesting mistakes and how to correct them. So. Ooh, and how to correct them. Awesome. Yes. So not only can we see what not to do, but we can yeah, replace we'll them with, with mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> some suggestions. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. You guys, the website will be in the show notes below, ChristinaMWeber.com. Five manifesting mistakes and how to correct them because a lot of us are in that pivot space. We're like, all right, we know we're made for more. We know we've got people that to impact or we, we've got this, this kind of brewing in our body that we want to do something else. But there is that fear that, that stops us. But when you know these skills, you guys, the fear can dissipate a bit because you feel like you know what to do next. And instead of an inconstant wonder, what do I do? I don't know. You know, you have a roadmap to take those steps, which builds your confidence. So two last questions for you, Christina. I know you are consistently learning and growing and creating products that are helpful to your clients, but I want to know how you stay filled up. So what are two things you do every day that you couldn't live without? Um, let's see. Well, I mentioned my little grounding routine. That's definitely, I have a thing called relationships and threes uh, I created and it's based on Christ. We need different kinds of relationships. So we need relationships where we're receiving. Uh, We need relationships that are pure relationships. And we need relationships where we're giving. So uh, if you look at Christ, he was in the scripture with Peter, James, and John. Well, those are kind of his pure relationships. He went to prayer with the Trinity. That's kind of where he's receiving. And then he's God. So he he ministers to all of us. So I try to have a grid. I actually have nine different relationships that I fill in. So I make sure I'm receiving, I'm giving, and I have peer relationships. And I will tell you, that's a secret sauce because it's hard. You cannot be close to everyone. But by having that framework and combining it with my grounding routine, I feel really secure. I mean, I feel like I actually visualize this, Denise, of walking towards Christ on water like Peter did and, you know, not worrying about the storm. And, and I think why I feel like it's easier to visualize that is because I do feel like I, it's taken years to fill in all these slots, by the way. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, I just, sometimes you have them and you have to fill them in. So, but um, that is those two things, just having my, I know people have my back. I know I have that secure system and I know I'm connected to God. And just those two things, it's like, that's going to work. Absolutely. You know, I just, just walk towards them. I'll be fine. You know, you are secure and supported because you are giving and receiving and collaborating. Yep. Mm-hmm. So what books are you reading right now? Who are you learning from? Yeah, I halfway finished Napoleon's Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Oh, I have a, a guy I did a radio show with Peter DeMoss. He's a, was a late in life convert. So I'm finishing up his book. And I read some books on love that lasts a lifetime. You know, for me, reading self-help books is fun. (laughs) Like Uh other people, it's like, oh, that's work on read fiction. I love doing that. Mary Lou uh, Hemingway, Hemingway, she was the gal on on Taxi. 
she read a book on that I just read on, um, I can't remember what the title was, Showing Up Your Best Self or something like that. She's really into personal development and things like that. So I like, you know, I like getting a variety of stuff, but I like, you know, I like businessy stuff too. And um, do you have any ones that have, have been pivotal books for you? You know, it's hard to decide was a good one. Brian Tracy, uh, Eat That Frog. That's been really, I've actually am trying to incorporate his stuff in my, my stuff. One of the things I recommend to my clients and actually when I do my uh, Christian manifesting workshop is The One Thing by Gary Patterson, huge. The Big Leap is another great one uh, about fears and uh, your upper limit problem. Yeah, those are some good ones. There's also a book on Attached that I use in my narcissist group. And it's it's actually was recommended by a dating coach. And it talks about the different attachment styles, which I think is good to know in general. I think sales in your business is a lot like dating. I'll be <laughs> it's understanding, you know, there's certain people that are avoidant. They don't want to do what Denise, you're talking about. They don't really want to grow. If you are doing that in your business and you're trying to sell them, it's like a waste of your time. You want to work with people who are of a healthy attachment or even an anxious attachment um, are people that really have the ability to connect with other people and they're good clients for what I do. So that's actually a good, good book. Uh, of course, a little assessment test in there too on your own attachment style. But I think the big leap and the one thing, I use the one thing a lot in my coaching because it's all about vision uh -huh. and it's, and, and it's really helps order your vision and it's about you know, I used to have everything was a top priority. Well, guess what that means? Nothing's Nothing. a priority. <laughs> yep. so, so what I've learned is this one thing. He really says that people who are successful, they understand if one this one thing were in order, everything else would fall in place. So when you have people figure out what that one thing is, which is very different, you know, for each person. And then the other goals are sub goals of that. There's something about your brain that really helps you order that because it's like, okay, yeah, that is relevant because it ties to this. You know, we have choices all the time, conflicting priorities. We have to say yes, we have to say no. I mean, really being successful is about learning what to say yes and what to say no to. So that is super helpful. I mean, I use that all the time, that language with my clients in that book. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your experience. You have a long-term vision for yourself and for others, yet the discipline of doing something every day that's going to take move the needle within your business. And then you're able to teach that with everybody you coach and train and you're giving them skills, not just skills for like what they should do today, but really they can use these skills over and over again in all areas of your life. So you guys check out the five manifesting mistakes and how to correct them at Christina M Weber.com. Thank you so, so much for spending time with us today. Oh, thanks Denise for sharing your tribe and all that you're doing. So you're a rock star. <laughs> so fun. Thank you. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. I want to hear your aha moment from today's amazing episode. If you could leave a review at whatever podcast player you choose to listen from, Apple Podcast, CastBox, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you're listening from, leave a review and share with us your favorite part of today's episode. Thanks for hanging out. And remember to dream big.